‫צהריים טובים. ‫פילינג אספשלי פריבילג' טודי, ‫זאת כל אחד מכם, ‫אחר נייט שכל אחד מכם ‫היו עבוד את זה, ‫אחר נייט שכל אחד מכם ‫היו עבוד את זה, ‫אחר נייט שכל אחד מכם ‫היו עבוד את זה, ‫אחר נייט שכל אחד מכם Uh, any questions, thoughts, anything before we start? Okay, so uh, Matan and Sharon, please open, uh, open your uh, uh, videos. Uh, again, if you can't, and I mean, I prefer that you watch the, the recording offline. One second, I need to close the door here. Okay. Okay, so any questions, thoughts, something that you want to ask about the course, about anything else, about the political situation, about, uh, kidding. Okay, so uh, the plan for today is as follows. I'll start uh, with where I stopped last time with screening, and then we'll get to a point where I'll ask, I'll, I'll turn the, the Sharvit uh, to our speakers uh, of today. We have one uh, uh, student lecture uh, by Sharon and uh, Matan, and that will fit nicely, I think, in the first hour. And uh, then I'll continue a little bit more. And uh, then I'll, I'll, I'll stop and I'll, I'll, I'll turn, I'll, I'll change gears and uh, talk about the final project in, the, in this course. And then I'll go back to the screening and continue. Uh, you can, uh, if, if you downloaded the presentation of the, um, my presentation from lecture six about the screening, then uh, you could re-download it because I added slides and change things and it's now much longer also. And it's, I think it will go even to next, to, to next Wednesday a little bit. So, uh, so we'll see about that. Uh, yeah, and, and, and the slides about the projects, I kept them in the, I, I, I uploaded them only to the Moodle. I didn't put them, uh, I didn't make them public because part of them are uh, data that is uh, collaborations with our, other researchers in the world. I don't know how, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure that they'd like uh, their preliminary results to be public and our preliminary interaction. So this is not going to be available online in the website, but in the, in, in the Moodle uh, website. Okay. Okay. Yeah, ah, we're going to have next week, where's my calendar? Next week, we're going to have a guest lecture by Tami Riklin Raviv. She's from Electrical Engineering. And she's doing uh, computer vision in uh, medical and, uh, and uh, microscopy imaging. So she'll come from a more technical perspective, how to solve what we're usually we're calling the standard problems of bioimage analysis, segmentation tracking. So her research is focused on that, on, on, on novelty in algorithms and improving the state of the art in terms of uh, performance. So this is the lectures we're going to have next week. It's not going to take the full uh, lesson, probably one to two hours, uh, depends on Tammy. I asked her to, give to, to allow me to also speak because I'm not able to talk about everything that I want here. And then in the 26th, we're going to have a lecture uh, that I, I'm going to speak. And then we're going to have uh, in the 2nd of June, a lecture, a guest lecture from uh, Tal Shai, who is going to look at computational biology from another perspective, not from the imaging perspective, but I thought it's good for uh, Ascala uh, Klalit for general knowledge about systems biology. I mean, this is the lecture that she's going to give uh, also one to one and a half, two hours to the most. And then in uh, June 9th, we're going to have a guest lecture by a, a, a friend of mine from uh, Marseille, Paul uh, Willutrix. 
is a new uh, scientist in, uh, in uh, a new research center in Marseille. He actually was here in Israel in the Weizmann Institute for a postdoc. Uh, there there where, where I met him. And uh, he's going to talk about uh, relate integration between imaging and omics in, in, in the context of mostly of the developmental system, but how to merge together and integrate different data sets. Uh, uh, I, I think it's going to be pretty cool. And then we're going to have in the 16th, the last, uh, the last lecture of the course. Okay. So we stopped around here. And I remind you, this is the general, so we talked about, about screening and cell phenotyping from different perspectives. And we said that there is one flavor of, uh, of uh, knowing what you want to measure and just measuring it. And when you know what you want to measure, that's the best thing to do, right? Remember this uh, bacteria going into cells, we want to kill the bacteria and they keep, they keep the cell alive, right? This was the example there. So when we know what we need, that's the best situation. It's easiest in terms of, uh, of uh, data science, basically. Then uh, the other uh, possibility is that the, a human expert can annotate, but uh, the human expert can, does not know exactly how he does it, right? I mean, can see something and say, okay, this is healthy, this is sick, this is good, this is bad, et cetera, or put a number without just, just by intuition or some different rules that the, the, the user combines, the expert combines together from his experience. And then we can uh, integrate machine learning within the loop. Uh, this was the second uh, possibility. And the third and the most exciting for us, I think, is, uh, is uh, what is called self-profiling, uh, where we represent a, a, a well or a cell or a treatment with, with, a, with a high dimensional vector of uh, whatever we can measure. So we measure everything. And it, it was done until recently with the standard measures of, uh, I mean, from engineered measure, not standard, engineer measures from the image. And now every, everything turns, of course, to deep learning uh, techniques. Uh, and the idea here is that uh, and we talked about application in drug screening, mechanisms of action. If we have a company and we want to understand what it does exactly in terms of the molecular, uh, what, what molecules it pinpoints, et cetera. Um, and, uh, and, and uh, yeah. So, so it has several applications and, uh, and uh, basically the idea is measure everything and then see whatever, and, and then let the data speak. Let the data find the patterns for you, for us. We talked about all of the technical difficulties within the cell profiling. So we talked, the cells are crazy creatures. They can feel different between days. The experimentalist could do things a little bit differently. The microscope could do it different, a little different. So we talked about uh, all types of, uh, of uh, batch effects, day-to-day -day variability, confounding factors, et cetera, all, 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 all type of difficulties, technical difficulties, and even illumination, all type of things that are in the way from the imaging to getting a, eventually a profile and getting some knowledge from what we measured, which is, complex here. I mean, you have this, this is really noisy and uh, tricky data to deal with, but this is, this is reality. And uh, we stopped, we stopped when we talked about the uh, interpretability. So uh, we talked about uh, a, a one way to interpret the results is, for example, in here, cluster the phenotype, cluster the different wells together, and then extract a, a, a representative image of the well, and from that come to some conclusions uh, on, on, on what, what, what is different between those different clusters. Uh, and we can do that in terms of the visual, and we can then go back to the annotation. Annotation is in this case, it's the, it's the chemistry, it's the compound that was the, the cells were treated with, and check whether there is a relation between similarity with, within the chemical compound and the, uh, and the, um, and the um, uh, visual output. Questions?
Okay. Uh, here is uh, here is another way to look at this, right? So we have the different clusters in this case. We have here six clusters, and we can look at the average uh, uh, feature features uh, for each cluster, the feature vector for each cluster, and look for features that distinguish between clusters. Of course, this is not very, you know, it's not the 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 the, the most uh, the it's maybe the the most the, the, the most uh, naive way to, to look for what, what is encoded within the different clusters. And I presented to you last time toward the end of the class a uh, visualization. Now, this is one example uh, and it's very specific. I like it, but it's, you know, it's my personal opinion, but in, in, in principle, visualization is super important in order to find, to understand what's going on within this, uh, this high dimensional complex data. We need to be able, even if it's not the visual representation of a, a glimpse of, of a cell like here, we need to be able to, to interpret what is the output and be able to, to explore the data and explore the data both in the space, high dimensional spaces of feature spaces, et cetera, and both in the visual space of the image. So visualization is a key thing, thing in, 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 in profiling, and not only in profiling, in all the field of trying to understand something about biology uh, based on microscopy images. So this is a, a glyph-based method. Uh, the, the authors here defined a, a, a visual representation of different features that they measure that give some intuition on what's going on. For example, uh, you can see here the, the nucleus texture with these uh, yellow dots. Uh, you can see this uh, roughliness of the contour of the cell. You can see how many the, the protrusions that is that are in the cell, how many arms the, the cell is extending, etc. The length, the width, the, the nucleus width, etc. All the parameters are, are visually accessible. And this gives us, instead of looking at this table, it will give us an easier way to stare at the images and come to conclusions. So in this case, uh, it's an open source MATLAB toolbox. I think they also, also implemented it now for Python, but I'm not sure. In this case, they visually encoded 20, 21 variables and they allow customization. So if you have your own parameters that you are interested in, you can, uh, you can uh, encode them within this uh, software. And uh, besides being uh, visual, uh, giving us visual, uh, a nice, pretty visual uh, kind of uh, semi-art uh, like this, uh, we can actually do something like that. So here, here's an example from their paper. So here is a did hierarchical clustering, which is, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure that all of you know what it is. It's a very simple clustering algorithm. Actually, if you don't, then here is the explanation. Bringing from similarity, actually teaches now in my, in my introduction to computer science course. So, so I assume that everybody, although you didn't learn my course, I assume that you know what, what it is. Anyway, it's clustering. It doesn't matter how. And so we have here, here we have the treatment at the columns, at the, at, the, at the rows here, we have different features. And here we have the clustering that uh, were achieved from the, this, uh, from the hierarchical clustering. And now I mean, staring at this, okay, we can say maybe cluster four, uh, one and cluster five have here, have here more red, which is more NF, what is NF? I'm not even sure. Uh, cluster one is enriched within the cell texture. Uh, cluster, I don't know, four and maybe a little bit two, or let's say cluster five is, has reduced roughliness in the, in the cell. But this is, again, this is not very easy. The, the second option is looking at visualization. So again, each representative image for each treatment, and then you can start getting some idea on what's going on here. But it's still very anecdotal, it's not systematic, and uh, you can see that cluster one and cluster five, uh, cluster three, for example, are very different from one another, but it's still, or cluster one and cluster four are very different from one another. Here, the cells are kind of clumped together, for example, and here they are uh, more dispersed. But, but how did, how was it clustered here? It was clustered by manually, by, 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 uh, by someone, but someone with knowledge or by the software? No, so here it's hierarchical clustering, and they decide. I don't don't remember how they decided those five clusters exactly, but who cares? It's just trying to just. I mean, this is basically trying to pitch the 
visualization, the, the, the contribution of visualization, why visualization could be important, could help, okay? Okay, so we said first, uh, just looking at the, at the, at the table is not very informative. Uh, clustering like this and looking at the feature is not very informative. Looking at visual phenotypes, it is informative. You can start and see the differences in a better, maybe in a better way, but it's first, it's anecdotal. And second, you do not necessarily capture everything here. Uh, another option here is take uh, all the different treatments here. So you have, for cluster four, you have three different treatments and average them together and have a representative vector that represents your, uh, the average of a vector of your cluster. And then you can look at it and, and here you have cluster one and you have the different features in the average cluster one. For example, you can see that the cell length and cell widths are small and the neighborhood tractions, so there is a lot of neighborhood, which actually makes sense if you look here. The cells are small, they're clumped together. So it, it makes sense. Or you can look at it like here. I mean, the, you have here the different clusters and then bar plots for the different features. Again, fine, still. And then uh, the, 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 what they propose is uh, using their GLIM. And, uh, and, 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 and based on that, they argue that it's more visually interpretable and easy to explain what are the differences. So it, it is a quantitative representation. It's not, no, not, not that someone has manually now uh, created this uh, figure. They created a, a, a mapping between numbers to visualization. And, uh, and then when you have numbers for the average cell within a, a cluster, you can visualize it. And then you can see very clear the different properties and how they change between the different clusters. And I, I agree with them that it's, it's a, you know, it's a simple idea. It's a, it's a, it's a cool trick. And I think it's, a, it's useful. My purpose in telling you that, I mean, it's really not the most uh, important paper in the world, but uh, just to, to open your mind a little bit to the importance of visualization. In this case, it's the visualization for interpretation, but visualization in general is super important. So here is another example from this paper. Excuse me for the quality. It was a quick uh, slide making and screenshotting for the class. And so you can see here that the scatter plot is not always very informative. Uh, here we see scatter plots of uh, yeah of the different uh, whatever condition. Uh, here it's different cell types, and then you they they uh, they did dimensionality reduction with PCA, and it was it's not very informative and when you do something like this you start to it's much easier to understand what's going on right so you, you can see that this and and now they can even say something about the biology here although you could say the same thing from this figure if you look at the encoding of the principal components for example but here it's it jumped to your eyes right i mean so you can show it to a biologist and or, or someone else and quickly explain what's going on so on the Right here, you see more mesenchymal-like cells, which are uh, larger, they have uh, more elongated, they have more activity, more ha uh, hands that are doing stuff. This is the, the protrusive activity. Uh, and low neighborhood traction means that they, they are more independent. They are not uh, like all together, clumped together with other cells, but they are more moving independently. While you can look at the epithelia-like cells, which are have less protrusion, uh, less spread, they are smaller, and the uh, high neighborhood attraction, so they are more clustered together. Okay, so you can correct, in this case, you characterize the different cell types. Instead of putting them into clusters, you can actually put them in the space and visualize what's going on. Questions? Okay, other ideas of visualization, it becomes more, uh, more things that we might be more, uh, more modern is uh, is uh, is uh, going a lot along a phenotypic continuum so here you see uh, egan worms like going from one it's like it's like a, basically it's like a, a morphing right and i showed you also in the melanoma project right morphing from one state to another so uh, here you can see these are, these, are, 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 these are not neural networks, actually. These are earlier versions of generative modeling that allowed to go from 
uh, one from, from, from one state to another and follow the transition. And then you can understand what's going on. What is changing between the healthy and the sick, uh, in this case, world? And, and, and you can put numbers on what, what's going on in intermediate states and, and stuff like that. Uh, so uh, the early days of generative modeling, and we had one uh, student lecture on that, uh, on a really early work, um, but there is uh, more work, and uh, Bob Murphy has a, has a software for that called the Cell Organizer, where he tried to explicitly model the different interactions between components within the cell to build an holistic representation of a cell. So yeah, it's not deep learning on the one hand. On the, on the other hand, you actually define here the relations between the different uh, cellular components, which is also an advantage because you, 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 you don't need to work in the, in the black box domain of the neural network. You actually model explicitly what's going on in the composition of the cell. So there are advantages also in, 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 in direct ways of trying to build a, 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 a a modular um, representation of the cell. And uh, this is a spoiler for our student uh, talk for today. Uh, you can do generative modeling with deep learning. Uh, for example, follow uh, latent trajectories. Uh, and I'm going to, I'm not going to talk about it because I'm not going to uh, spoil uh, Matan and uh, Sharon's uh, talk for today. And of course, uh, the best work of all is my own, and uh, you can do uh, uh, you can go and, and do more complex uh, latent trajectories that are not dependent on the unsupervised uh, space, and go from sick to healthy, etc., uh, in high dimensional space, and and uh, use the generative properties of the network to act actually interpret uh, what's going on. Okay, so I think this is a good uh, time to stop. And uh, and uh, to, and give uh, Matan and uh, Sharon uh, the stage. And yeah, take it away. Okay, can you hear me? Let's see if I can share the screen. Okay. Can I take the screen off? Ah, can that Okay. Tell me if you can see my screen. Yeah. Okay, very good. Um, okay, so let's begin. Today we're gonna talk about the paper of predicting cell lineage using autoencoder and optimal transport, what Asaf uh, presented a uh, few few lessons ago, and today we're going to elaborate on that. So uh, cell, line, uh, cell lineage tracing is the process of identification cells, ancestors, and descendants throughout a biological uh, process. The difficult with this, with this process is that, as we know, it's hard to sample cells over time to, due to the destructive natures of the sampling, experimental sampling. So what we do is, what we do here is with given two data sets, the blue one and the red one from two stages, uh, two different stages in the biological process, we want to predict the lineage between the source target, the source population, uh, the blue in the pictures and the red uh, data set and the red in the picture and the, the target uh, population. So how we do it, we use autoencoder and optimal transport. So as Asaf said in the previous lessons, and uh, now again, uh, we first, we use autoencoder. So we train the autoencoder uh, with the given data sets, as we can see in the uh, left picture, the left image. And we, we use the autoencoder in order to move into the lower space, the latent space representation of the cells. Uh, and then we use optimal transport in order to uh, find the trajectories and we elaborate uh, afterwards how the optimal transport is uh, performed. And after we, we compute those trajectories, we can uh, decode along the, uh, the trajectory and, and uh, uh, result in a, 
image in the measurement space in the original space and we can see the the lineage in the in the biological process as we can see in the green image only only the green image is the real image and all the rest are predicted by uh, the decoded along that uh, the trajectory so as we said uh, the main uh, a main part of our method is using op uh, optimal transport in order to compute uh, the trajectories so how is it made how is it performed is uh, with given two data sets or more uh, of uh, cells in different stages as we said uh, the the goal is to to transform the first uh, the first data set to the second data set distribution and we do so uh, under minimizing the transform the transformation cost and in our case as you can see is the uh, distance between uh, cells in the latent space e is a representative of the encoded encoder function and after we uh, perform this uh, minimization uh, we do metric scaling uh, as for the first data set or the second data set depends on if you want to go forward in time or backward in time and it results in a prob probability matrix which uh, cell ij is uh, the probability of cell i to transform into cell j in the process and therefore when we, we get the probability we know what is the most likely transformation and then we can match uh, those cells in the latent uh, representation space and then we have the trajectory between those spaces okay uh, so uh, moving on to uh, results on uh, tumor cells domain experiment. Uh, the experiment itself uh, takes images and labels from uh, four days of uh, cell state and generates the cell imaging from day one, two, and three to, day to the day uh, number four. Uh, and the predicting itself is uh, by, uh, on the outcome by a neural network classification and giving the cell type. Uh, we can see here that the previous uh, methods like just using uh, optimal transport and, and to the autoencoder and the uh, autoencoder and the optimal transport uh, achieved uh, improvement of almost 20% and uh, preserving it, preserving it uh, from day one, day two, and day three. Okay, next slide, yeah. Uh, contribution. So uh, the main contribution is the interpretability of the dynamic changing changes along the, the process. Uh, we can see that uh, the first uh, row, it's a day one cell imaging. And in the second row, we see a day four cell changes by the trajectories created along the process. After that, the decoding will generate the cell state image. A critic. Uh, as a self showed in previous lecture on melanoma, uh, there can be a nonlinear trajectory between cells, and also the environment of the cells can affect the cells' mutation, which makes the generation of the uh, cell state uh, more challenging. And uh, personal opinion, uh, uh, what we like is. Uh, that they used an uh, unsupervised uh, mechanism for the cell state generation, uh, which actually does not require any previous info on the data or on the uh, biological process. And that they created an application that helps to generate the cell's starting state, which helps to fight disease like uh, breast cancer, as we can see in the image. Uh, the right side is uh, the progressive step of the cell, and they generated the HME1 prior state. So they can uh, then uh, look at the cells at the first uh, earlier stages and, uh, and uh, act uh, uh, in uh, earlier stages. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions? Um, I have only question about the data. Uh, the data is 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 you have for each cell its own it, all all the process, or you have uh, 
the beginning and the end, but it, the data is tagged, right? That's what I mean. I mean, yes, so, tagged what is the beginning, what is the end, and uh, which is which cell. Yes, so as we can see in this picture, uh, the, the data is from, uh, from each snapshot of the process. So we can see there's, uh, for example, the purple one and the green one. So we can see that these are data from different stages of the process, different days in our case. And we perform the process along these snapshots, this data. But it, it's the same cell. The same cell was captured day after day. So it's isolated on a plate. It's not uh, something that was... Uh... Uh, no, uh, in my understanding, it's not uh, always the same cell. It's the same process. Okay. Um, the, using the optimal transport uh, does not assume it's the same cell. It, it's just in order to calculate uh, probabilities, uh, but it, must, it does not uh, require it to be the same cell. It requires to be the same process in the different uh, stages. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. More questions? So I'll say a few words. Um, it's never the same cell, Gil, in principle. They, they, they collect, uh, it's, it's, it's a continuous process. They want to model a continuous process that cannot be, or it's very difficult to measure with live imaging. So what they do, basically, they take, uh, they, they, they stop the process in, in different stages on different samples, on different experiments, and collect all the data from the different, in this case, different days, and then try to build a, traje a trajectory along this day. But the data is not the same data, it's not the same set. Okay, okay so, so it's one too many. So for any beginning uh, cell, we can have many different uh, uh, options, which are more more like to the, 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 the looks, most, mostly the same to each other, but different samples. So they, yeah, right? so, they use, so you don't jump from a cell to a cell. This is the, the idea is to use the generative properties of the network in order to model this dynamic process on data that you have that is static. So in principle, you can, can you go back to the slides that you showed before? This one? Yeah, so in principle, if you look here at the, at the yeah. left side, you have the different days of the, the, right, the data along the different days. And you can follow a trajectory here from day one to day four, and the, the, the decision on in the latent space, right? And, and then you can use the generative properties of the network to generate how a cell like this will look. This is what they do, okay? Now, I try to, to try to understand how they feed the network. That's what I try to understand because you have to put something at the beginning and something at the end to, for the network to compare it. So they, they can do one too many. It's not one to one. That's what I mean. So, so what would you say, uh, Sharon, Matan? What, what was the optimization of the network? So in, in general, when you're using uh, Auten Polar's network, uh, we want to minimize the, the reconstruction error. So uh, we use the, uh, as we usually do in Auten Polar's, but when using uh, these properties of different data set, we, we often, add a, a regularization uh, uh, term to the loss, func to the loss function, uh, which is different from case to case. It, it is shown in the, in the paper. It, uh, it's quite specific to the single cell they given, uh, but there's, there's a, a distribution, the regularization term in order to, to understand the differentiation between the first data set and the second data set. It's in, General. So, so Gil, I think that your question, if, if, I, if I, maybe I understood it uh, differently or wrongly, I don't know, but uh, it basically it's an autoencoder. The input is the output. So you learn a representation of the cell and then you go, then you have a latent vector and this PCA that you see here on the left is PCA on the latent vector that's generated by the autoencoder. Am I, is it true, Matan, Sharon? Yes, yes, sure. So I, th I think this is what you were asking about. So you don't try to use the autoencoder to predict the future in terms of time. You just use it to encode the representation and to have the decoder to generate new images. And then you can use this representation to follow a trajectory. 
in the latent space. In this case, a trajectory that is defined by, well, visually you can see it with the PCA, but in principle, the idea is moving it with the optimal transport uh, 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 technique. Okay. okay. So this is the, the general intuition, I think. Um, okay, my, a few comments about presentation. So first, uh, it was very improved to what uh, we had in our personal meeting. Second, uh, it's still, I mean, you, have, you, you used only seven minutes out of the 10 minutes. Now, the, it's not a good sign. I'm telling it so everybody here because it's a good, if you have 10 minutes, use your 10 minutes. I mean, you can, I can talk about this paper for an hour, maybe not, I, yeah, I can, at least half an hour, right? Uh, so, I mean, in principle, you need to fill up your time. So you can explain better, you can show more examples. For example, in here, I, it wasn't very clear what examples they used. So one example was a, a developmental process, the day one to day four, which actually makes sense because it is a continuous process. Another example that they used was uh, they took uh, uh, metastatic uh, cells and categorized them as high and low or something aggressive, less aggressive, and went along that trajectory, which is, I would say, the biology there is a bit shaky, I would say. And the third, they just they took different cell types and followed the trajectory just at the beginning, just to show that. The, so anyway, I'm trying to give uh, more information, but I'm, I'm, I'm showing how you can, if you have three minutes more, it's a lot of time. And if you yes. don't use it, it's, it's uh, it, 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 you know, you need to use your time. So this is one, one, uh, one thing. And the second that I see now, I mean, and it's also important for speaking with other people and especially for presentation. A lot of people are really good presenters. And then uh, when it comes to the Q&A, when it comes in a conference to questions and answers, uh, they, they don't do a good job. And it, it, it creates a very bad impression of the person uh, if they cannot answer uh, the question. So there, there are two things now. Uh, one that I wanted to, to say. One is understand what you are asked. So it's not always clear because the question, first you are stressed, right? You are not, uh, you are not used to presenting and maybe the, you know, you're presenting to a, to, a, to a room full of people or Zoom, I don't know, and it's stressful and you're not fully focused. And, and, and the, the, the person who asked the question maybe is not menasech, um, is not, um, by the way. It's not putting the words right, right? I mean, it's not, that, it's not asking the question in the best way possible. And, and one of the techniques here to, to, to help your, the, the person who is asking a question and understand what he's asking, is asking leading questions. So are you asking about, so do you mean that, and, and making sure that you understand the question because otherwise you might be answering for, you might be answering a different question. So I think it's important for, especially in scientific, uh, presentation but also in any type of presentation and the other thing that uh, is not here i mean we're all friendly here but uh, you get to see a lot in scientific conferences is uh, dealing with uh, oh and it's not if, if you don't know really don't you know you can say it's better to say you don't know than start uh, you know start making up things that are wrong i mean this would this would be really bad in this case and and, and another thing is uh, that i want to mention is aggressiveness so there are People who ask questions to, because they want to show how smart they are and they want to, they are, a lot of times they're also very aggressive and trying to, to, to attack. Uh, you need to, to be aware. First, you need to be calm. For me, it was really difficult to, to learn that and I'm still improving myself on, on that because I'm, I'm like very, when someone attacks me, I want to attack back, but, but you need to take it and, and relax. Uh, if they are aggressive, it's their problem, and people will see that. So people, uh, people around will see that they are, you know, they are the assholes and not you. And you need to be as calm and answer the question. Just try to, you know, to answer the question. And uh, and I'm saying that because uh, for me it was a big uh, tra trajectory learning to do it, and I'm still improving myself on that. Uh, okay. Any other thoughts, questions? Uh, sorry. The one thing that I want to stress here is that the main limitation in my, I, I, I like this paper, I think it's a, it's, it's a cool paper. Um, 
I think that the main limitation here is that they assume that there is a trajectory in the a clear trajectory in the phenotypic space, which is not always the case. It's a lot of in the latent space. In a lot of cases, it is the situation where you can move along a trajectory from one from one point to another. But sometimes, like in the melanoma case, when I when you do some dimensionality reduction, when you look to these trajectories, there is a lot of uh, the, the most dominant signal is signal that is not related to the function, to what you are interested in. And in this case, this, this uh, technique is just not going to work. So I, I'm not sure if they talked about it in their, uh, in their um, paper or not, but for me, this was the, the, the main limitation uh, in this paper. But, it, but it's fine. It was one, one of the first papers that, that, that tackled this uh, question. So it does need to be perfect. And, and I think it's a good paper. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, and I'll take the lead back from here. Okay, so after we have uh, basically we have this uh, all, the whole pipeline going from imaging to uh, all the technical issues of quality control and quantification and doing a profiling and then doing post-processing, et cetera, and interpretation and everything. Now, basically we have a toolbox for screening. So Anne Carpenter, I stole from her. A lot of this presentation is stolen from her. I mean, she, not stolen, she gave me the slides. Uh, but but uh, you can see here, her lab is, 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 is developing a software that is uh, one of the leading software for these types of applications. And uh, that she started as, actually it's an interesting story because she's a biologist by training and she started developing the software when she, when she uh, wanted to quantify stuff and she, she saw that there is nothing out there. And then, and now she's leading a, basically a computer science and engineering lab in the Broad Institute, which is, which is a really nice institute and, and, building, the, and building the software a cell profiler, leading the, Cell profiler software, uh, and in her uh, and and here are examples of uh, things that she screened that uh, her lab screened, and you can see here many many examples from uh, worms to 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 defects in uh, in cell division, uh, mitochondria, more worm, HIV, uh, different uh, uh, pathways, the immune cells, the malaria. Uh, and and uh, different um, aspects of screenings that have that you know translational impact, and you can go to cell profiler and see how our software is uh, helped uh, to translational. And it means that the, in developing drugs, so several of the hits that they found are already in in different stages of uh, drug development. And, and as I showed you, I think two weeks ago, uh, there is a bricha. There is a flourish, I don't know how to say it in English, but, but a lot of now uh, a, a traditional drug truck companies and new startups are, are building the, are using these techniques and showing the, and trying to use the potential in, uh, in uh, visual uh, phenotypic screening. The future of phenotypic screening. So where, where the field is going, this part of the field at least. So this is a, a personal opinion, but uh, but a lot of it, I think there is agreement uh, regarding part of it and, and part of it maybe less, but this is how I see it. So basically the outlook is more. We want more from everything. We want more complexity, we want more data, we want more, okay? So one is a uh, more channels. And I think I talked about the cell painting essay, uh, which is uh, an essay where different, uh, different staining of the cells are imaged in different channels. So you can see here, that uh, when you image a cell, you can image a cell in five different channels, having eight different uh, organelles, organelles evronim, the evronim shalata. So this is the nucleus, this is the, the plasmic reticulum. This is a, this, this staining had, uh, have uh, a cytoplasm and nucleoli, so two different organelles. So in total, you have eight organelles encoded here within an, one image of, of, of a cell or of a field of view. And then uh, we can extract signatures from each cell's image. 
and match this profile to again to do the same the same cell profiling only that now we have information very rich information from all these channels channels and complementary information that give us a lot more uh, features and information uh, to work with uh, yeah and examples and another examples and uh, yeah Yeah, and one of the examples that uh, I'm thinking about in the future is uh, doing in silico labeling. So using the techniques that we showed in the, in, in, uh, the deep learning uh, lectures about mapping a, a right field modality to different uh, fluorescent channels, and then using this information in order to screen for new phenotypes. Basically, this will uh, give us much more, if it works, it will give us many more channels of information uh, for uh, it to work with. Now, there is a, okay, and when we say this is more channels, but there is now a huge effort uh, from uh, different labs in academia and uh, philanthropic uh, and, uh, and the drug industry, et cetera, to create a really, really huge data set, public data set, that will uh, have a, a cell painting, uh, a lot of uh, cell painting data, screening data. And you can go in here, you see it's uh, also, it's the, the, the initiation is still from the Broad Institute and you can see the, the participants. I mean, it's really impressive. And they are going to generate really, you know, imaginary amounts of uh, data. It's very attractive for a uh, data scientist. And uh, the one thing, I mean, they are going to, to have to generate the data and then they're going to release it publicly only a year later. So they, they have you know, the first uh, stab at this data, but, but it's fine. I mean, they're still, you know, they're putting a lot of effort in generating it and it will, in the long term, it's going to give a lot of, uh, it's going, a lot of people are going to use this data to, to play with it, to build tools, to whatever. So I think it's, it's really important. And, and there is a lecture, if you are interested, uh, I can point you to a lecture about this uh, consortium. Uh, another idea that I think uh, could be elaborator, elab elaborated is uh, heterogeneity. So the profiles in most of the papers, also what I showed you, takes a well with many, many cells. And even if the measurements are done at the single cell level, eventually they are averaged to a profile, which is one vector that represents all the cell in the treatment. Biology is not necessarily so homogeneous. And here is, and, and, and in principle, we, we would like to capture the variability within our data and not squish everything together to an average vector, especially because we can do it, right? And it might be very important. We might want to focus on a very rare subpopulation of cells that are actually causing damage. Or there might be that the treatment, some cells uh, uh, um, uh, are affected by it in one way uh, and other cells are, are reacting in a different way. So we would like to actually be able to measure that and to say this is the effect of the treatment, not just given average. So one paper from uh, two years ago uh, did initial steps in this direction. Basically they did something very simple. Instead of just using the average vector, they, or the average and the standard deviation, they also use the covariance between the, the different features. And you can see here an example where the average, when the, uh, the average and the standard deviation are the same in, two, in, in, in control and in treatment, but uh, you can even visually here, right? In the sketch, you can see that the visualization is very different. You can see that these are not the same treatments. And when you look at the covariance of the area and the elongation of the cells, you can see a very clear effect where here you see two clusters, basically really two clusters of cells. Some of the cells reacted to the treatment by, by enlarging and becoming large and elongated, and other became small and clumped together and more circular. And while the negative control, you saw heterogeneity all over the place. So in principle, this type of, if you add measurement statistics about whatever, about the, about the variability within the data, you should be able to do better. And I think this is open venue. I mean, people are, most people are not doing that, not, not looking at the variability. Microenvironment, this is personal. I mean, this is, I'm, I don't think that many people think about it. This is a paper that I really like. Actually, 
Uh, it's a paper that I really like because what they did, they looked at the, at the micro environment within the cell, so, so within the tumor. So they, they, they made a hole within the, within the mice and they imaged within a living mice. And they saw, the, uh, we say, they saw everything, but not everything, but they, they imaged several properties within the, the mice. So a uh, density of collagen fibers, this is some, some junk, fiber jungle that is in the, in the cell, uh, the density of the tumor cell, the number and uh, diameter of the blood vessel, number of microphages, which are not the tumor cells, are other cells in the tumor microenvironment. And then they correlate, and then they trained actually very basic machine learning and try to, to see if they can predict from the microenvironment, even without the tumor cells, even without the cells that are causing eventually the damage. And they showed that the microenvironment is predictive of, uh, of uh, something functional eventually that the cells are undergoing. I think it has potential to look at not only at you know, single cells, but the, the, the cells do not work in a vacuum. They need to interact with the microenvironment, with other cells, et cetera. And uh, this is an, an, an opportunity to move up in terms, it's more difficult, it's more complex to screen for that. But if we can do it, it's becoming more closer to the, to the level of what we really want to screen for, right? And I, I, I just mentioned that in this paper, I really liked it. And I know Boyana, the, the lead, the Boyana, yeah, I don't know how to pronounce her last name. Uh, she's uh, now a professor in, uh, in uh, Temple University in Philadelphia. Uh, so, I mean, one thing that is, uh, and I think uh, Anatoly mentioned that at some point when he presented his paper or at some point on one of the other papers, uh, here they did a mistake in terms of uh, training and testing data. So they took a, 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 ma a mouse and they had different imaging windows within the same mice, within the same mouse. And then when they uh, divided to train and test, they didn't take a mouse out as a test and, 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 and ignore that, but they mixed everything together. So they could have used windows from the same mouse to predict. So, so I think it's a little bit questionable and uh, probably it would work either way, but, but right. But anyway, uh, uh, the, the screening, the, the microenvironment or the microenvironment and the cells is something that I think is, has some potential, it might be interesting. 3D, so here is uh, one image from my, my friend, uh, Megan Driscoll, uh, which, which is not here, it's not only 3D. You see a 3D, an immune cell in 3D, and then you see the microenvironment around it. So I included also that just because it's cool. So this is not time, this is just a cell in 3D and just a visualization of it. And you can see that the complexity of the, how the cell, how the cell looks like. And uh, you can see, I mean, the morphology is super complex, much more complex than what we see when we squish cells in 2D and image them. And, uh, and, and now there are, it's, it's not only me thinking about that. I mean, there are even a uh, cell profiler, for example, have cell profiler 3D and there are other uh, tools and other uh, 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 people that are thinking about screening in 3D cells, again, single cells. Uh, if we want to go again, higher in the physiological relevant state, then we can go from single cells to aggregates of cells that are actually resembling a tumor or and these are called a patient-derived organoids or spheroids. So basically you take tumor, you, you take uh, cells, you let them build up like tumors within a dish. And now you screen the tumor. You do not screen the single cell anymore, but you screen the tumor. That's, there are some really cool papers that came out in the last uh, uh, two or three, no, actually two years, not, not more than that, that, uh, that do that, that try to screen uh, uh, organoids. I mean, still what they do at this point, uh, they screen for, so they, they use organoids, but, they, they, but the features that they extract are similar to a single cell. So now, instead of having an atomic unit, which is a single cell, now you have an atomic unit, which is an organoid. And now you can see here that you cluster different morphologies of organoids. Again, you lose the single cell resolution, you get the collective organization of the organoid, uh, and it gives you more physiological relevance because it makes more sense to see how a clump of cells that more resembles a, a real tumor reacts to different drugs than just single cells that are not connected to anything. That's, 
are less less relevant in terms of the physiology. I mean, we always want to be as close as we can to what really happens in order to in order to be more precise, to be more relaxed, to, re, to be able to rely more on what we get in our screens. Uh, one second, uh, I forgot to say. And another another thing here that I think is in, in our lab is in, you know in the, is trying to to look into that in in very long distance uh, in in the in the very long future I think is screening maybe not very long future actually a screening in uh, in the context of a single cell so you have a collective in this case organoid or it could be I mean we're not looking at organoids we're looking at simpler two D settings but you can think of organoids and now you can try and think about the composition of single cells within the organoid and how they change uh, in, in in terms of uh, uh, whatever morphology, uh, death, whatever in terms uh, after after uh, perturbation. So I think this is uh, uh, something that could be interesting, and our lab is putting a lot of effort here. And another thing that uh, is usually missed is temporal information. And uh, in recent years, there were multiple screens uh, that came out, screens and tools for screens that use temporal information. Uh, so. Um, so we have a project in our lab uh, that uh, alone that is uh, just is not here. It, it just went out uh, now about uh, screening uh, a dynamic event of a cell uh, internalizing external factors. Uh, it's called the endocytosis or the process of endocytosis. Uh, they, they already did a screen. Now we're trying to think about better ways to do that, but it's a dynamic process and you can follow them in, in live imaging. Uh, Goglia et al, uh, we're going to, actually I'm going to show you some data from that because it's a, it could be used as a project, a project in this course. So I'm going to show you that in the next hour. I'm going to show you examples of that. Uh, that the uh, screen for some signaling, which is called ERC. Uh, and uh, we're going to have, uh, I don't remember who picked this paper. Are they here? I don't remember. But someone picked this paper to present in, uh, I think, in the beginning of June. I don't remember who it was. So we're going to hear about this paper, which is a technique on how to on how to do it. So time information is another thing, and uh, I think that this is a good uh, time to stop here. And um, are there any questions before we move uh, before we go left Saka? מתחילו להיות עוד פעם ירי, אז אם תוכל לדבר ולהקליט את הזה על הפרויקט, כי יתחיל להיות הרבה ירי בחזרה. שיהיה מעולה. איך אתה יודע? אני רואה בטלוויזיה, ואני שומע בומים. הבנתי. הכל מוקלט. אוקיי. חוץ מזה, תיקח את הפלאפון למקלט, יהיה לך, לא יהיה לך משעמם. ואפשר לעבור לדרום, אצלנו, למרות שגם בלילה אצלנו היה שמח, אבל זה רגוע עכשיו. Yes, okay. okay, so uh, let's meet in uh, 10 minutes, in 20 past uh, three. I'm here if anyone has any questions. Hey, Asaf, something small about what I asked before, about how we do the auto-encoder. The way we build the auto-encoder for each of the days, for the days, ואז משתמשים בלייטנט וקטור, בעצם בוקטור האמצעי, במה שמתקבל ממנו בשלב אחד כדי לראות מה יצא בשלב, ומשתמשים בו בשלב, באוטו אנקודר של השלב האחרון, או בשלב שאתה רוצה לדמות אותו, וככה מקבלים את זה? איך עושים את הדבר הזה בדיוק? זה מה שלא הבנתי, את הפרוג'קשן הזה. אז לפי דעתי, ואני רואה שמתן ושרון כאן, אז יוכלו לתקן אותי אם אני טועה, הם פשוט אספו את כל הדאטה. והם יצרו את הלייטנט וקטור על כל הדאטה לאורך כל הימים. אוקיי, okay, ואז איך אתה יכול, איך אתה עושה את הפרוג'קט בין, זאת אומרת, יש לך משהו עכשיו, אתה רוצה לדעת איך הוא יראה עוד שבועיים? איך אתה עושה את זה? זאת אומרת, אתה צריך להכניס את זה למשהו אחר. כן, אבל, אבל הטענה היא בכלל בפסאודו טיים, ברעיון של פסאודו טיים, הרעיון הוא שאין לך, אתה לא יכול להסתכל בזמן אמת על מה אתה עושה. כן. אתה מתאר איזשהו עולם, אתה, אם אתה לוקח מספיק סטטיסטיקה של תאים, אז אתה יכול לראות איך, איך התהליך הזה נראה ואיך תא ייראה כאשר הוא נמצא בשלבים יותר מתקדמים בחיים שלו, בסדר? במקרה הזה. כל זה באותו מודל? מייצרים את הטראג'קטורי פחות או יותר על סמך, 
עצורה, ואז הולכים לאורך הטראג'קטורי הזה עם האופטימל טרנספורט הזה. טוב, זה יהיה מעניין, אני אולי אסתכל על זה אחר כך כבר, על המאמר עצמו, זה סתם מעניין אותי פשוט, מבחינה טכנית, טכניקה, איך עושים את הדבר הזה, אבל... טוב, נכנס... אם אפשר להוסיף משהו קטן, אז בעצם ב-Latent Space אתה מחשב את ה-Optimal Transport, ומשם אתה מסיט את הטראג'קטורי. זה העניין, המעבר זה עם ה-Optimal Transport. אם תעבור על המאמר, אתה... כן, כנראה שצריך לקרוא את זה כדי להבין, בסדר, סבבה. רגע, הם עושים את ה-Optimal Transport? אחרי, על הלייטנס, לא בזמן האופטימיזציה. לא, 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 בלייטנס ספייס, אחרי. כן, אוקיי, כן, כן, כן. כן, הסתברותי פשוט. אוקיי, תודה חבר'ה. טוב, נתראה עוד... אני נותן את האופציה להמשיך או להפסיק. המשפחה שלי גם תלמד וקצת, ותשמע קצת על הפרויקט הזה. באשדוד מעניין. בוא נחכה חצי דקה, אני אעלה להצטרף. לפי זה. האמת זה הגיוני ש... כן. השאלה היא להמשיך שיהיה לנו את החלק של, ה... של הפרויקטים או לוותר על זה, או לוותר על זה ולדחות את זה לשבוע הבא. מה אתם חושבים? זה במצגת של הפרויקטים, כאילו, אפשר אולי לראות לפני כן, ואולי שבוע הבא, כאילו, שכבר, כאילו... כן, אז המצגת של הפרויקטים, יש מצגת של פרויקטים, אני לא חושב שהיא סלטה קסטנטורי, אתם לא תצליחו, ואתם לא... מבחינתי... לפי דעתי, זאת אומרת, גם אין מניעה ל... לכמה אנשים לקחת את זה. בסוף הפרויקטים זה דאטה, השאלות זה שאלות שלכם. Yeah. אז, אז אני לא חושב שיש מניעה גם שכמה קבוצות או אנשים שונים יעבדו על אותו דאטה, כל הזמן שואלים שאלות שונות. השאלות זה החלק הקשה, זה אחד מהחלקים הקשים, זה יהיה החלק שלכם לחשוב מה השאלה, איזה שאלה מעניינת אפשר לשאול על הדאטה הזה. זה בעצם, אני חושב, האתגר, אחד מהאתגרים העיקריים בפרויקטים. אז אני מתלבט אם לעשות, עכשיו לעשות, להמשיך כאילו ולעשות ריקורדינג של זה או לחכות עם זה לשבוע הבא ולהתחיל כבר מההתחלה, לא יודע. אולי, אני אגיד לכם באופן עקרוני, כאילו, ואז אם יש לכם שאלות שאתם רוצים לדעת כרגע, עקרונית הלו"ז יש לנו עד... אני לא זוכר אם רביעי באוגוסט או שמיני באוגוסט, נראה לי שביקשתי הערכה וקיבלתי את השמיני באוגוסט לתת ציונים. מה שאומר שאם לוקחים, אם הולכים מזה אחורה, זה אומר שאני רציתי לעשות יום כזה, יום הצגת פרויקטים, ב, לא זוכר, בחמישי לאוגוסט, הגשה של הדוח. עוד לפני כן, בשני לאוגוסט, כן, אנחנו הולכים אחורה בזמן, ואז בעצם לתת את הזמן מעכשיו עד לסוף הסמסטר כדי לאשר את הפרויקט, כאילו כדי שאתם תשבו על הדאטה, תחשבו עליו, תחשבו מה אתם רוצים לשאול, וגם לעשות את זה בשני שלבים, שאתם מתייעצים עם ישעיה, כאילו אם זה נשמע, כי... כי... כי, כי אני רוצה שתנסו לחשוב בצורה יצירתית, זאת אומרת, תנסו לחשוב מה אפשר לחלץ מהדאטה ואיזה שאלות מעניינות אפשר לשאול. זה יכול להיות או טכניקות חדשות שלא השתמשו בהן, וזה, ואז אתם מראים שהם יותר טובים ממשהו, או, ועוד פעם, זה proof of principle, זה לא, זה כולה פרויקט של קורס, כן? או, או כשיש שלושה דאטה סטים, שהם דאטה סטים שאנחנו גם עובדים איתם במעבדה, בשלבים די התחלתיים כולם, ואפשר לחשוב שם על כל מיני רעיונות יצירתיים, יש, אני יכול לחשוב על מיליון כיוונים ש... שאפשר לקחת ולשאול עליהם. אז, אז בעצם המטרה היא עד לסוף הסמסטר, שזה המינימום, זאת אומרת שתהיו סגורים על, על פרויקט, ו, ותוכלו, כדי שיהיה לכם את הזמן לעבוד עליו עד, עד למועד ההגשה. אז אולי, לא יודע, אולי בהינתן שחצי כאן מהכיתה לא נמצאת, מסיבות מובנות, אז אולי נדחה את זה לשבוע הבא. 
מה אתם אומרים, או שיש לכם שאלות, או משהו זה, כאילו שאתם רוצים לדעת לפני. לדחות מה השבוע הבא? לא שמעתי. את השיחה על הפרויקטים. כי, <laughs> כי יש כאן, נראה לי, רוב האנשים נמצאים כבר בממ"דים ונעלמו ברמות שונות של ההיעלמות. כן, בטח. טוב, אני רציתי השבוע כדי לא זה, חבל שלא התחלתי מזה, אם הייתי יודע, זה הסתדר לי דווקא טוב הרצף של הדברים, אבל מי, מי, טוב, לא תיארתי לעצמי, אני תמיד אופטימי בדברים האלה. טוב, בסדר, אז יאללה, אז שיהיה לכם חג שמח ו... ונתראה ב... רגע, מגיעים אנשים. אתם רוצים לשמוע על הפרויקטים? כן, אני פספסתי, הייתה לנו מוזיקאים, בסדר. טוב, סבבה, אז יאללה, אני לוקח, אני אקח את הזמן בכל זאת להציג את הפרויקטים, אם מתחילות להיות עוד אזעקות וזה, אז אם זה לא מסתדר לכם, אז פשוט תגידו לי ואני אפסיק ואני אמשיך בשבוע הבא, בסדר? כן, אני אעשה הקלטה, הכל מוקלט. טוב, רגע, איפה הייתי? זה בכלל לא המצגת שהתכוונתי. אה. אוקיי. So the idea is... אוקיי, okay, so the idea is uh, that... Uh... I'm going to talk about the project, so it's recorded, and so people who cannot attend now will be able to listen to that uh, afterwards. And uh, if we're looking at the different uh, project types for this course, uh, I think the main ideas would be data mining and or integration of data from, di from different uh, resources. I think the integration is hard, I mean, hard for you guys, I mean, I will have a class on that. I would ha will have a lesson on how to take data from different uh, resources and try to generate new knowledge from integrating that. But like, I, 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 if someone wants, then, then great. I think it's, it's not trivial for people that do not come with the, with the biological background. So data mining and, and, and in terms of data, uh, you can either take a, a public repository. I will, I'll give you some names of the public repositories. Or uh, I'll show you today three internal data sets that the uh, students in the lab prepared for you to play with. And uh, these internal data sets, also the public repository, I think there are endless, uh, there are many options there. You can ask a lot of questions and try a lot of things on them. So uh, be creative and be ambitious. It's not uh, something we don't need to get to a final product, but show that you thought about it and come with a with a nice uh, proof of principle, even on a smaller data set or a simple question. Uh, yeah, and, and I think the contribution would be either try to ask a new question, and in the internal data sets, I think there are many open questions that can be asked easily, also in the public repositories, or show that you can use uh, new tools and improve uh, performance and how they work on this data. Uh, if you use new tools, then you need to evaluate, right? Uh, at least conceptually say, what is it good for? Well, what would be the limitations, etc. cetera, uh, to uh, the existing state of the art. It would also require you probably to read a little more about the literature and what's going on. And again, I'm aware that this is only a course, so you need to show me a proof of principle. And it's not, uh, you know, you're not here to do a PhD or a master's project on just the course project, but it is your, it is most of the evaluation of this course, so you need to take it very seriously. Timeline, May 11, May 11, ah yeah, here, so today, I'm telling you about the project and setting expectations, so I think I just did it. Uh, June 11 is a week before the end of the semester. Uh, set the time, again, half an hour to chat with Yeshaya, uh, and uh, and uh, hear the feedback from someone external. Uh, projects are in one or two, and don't do more than two, two people on, on one project. Uh, again, I want to stress again, Yeshaya is a little more um, uh, mature than you in terms of the 
in terms of the domain, because he's in the lab for this is his second year in the lab. But in other aspects, I mean, he's, he's, a, he's a master student, right? He's not, a, you know, take, take what he says with a grain of salt. It's not necessarily it's his own personal opinion. I'm also going to take to tell you my own personal opinion. You are going to take that also with a grain of salt, just I'm a little more experienced, that's all. So just keep that in mind. A week after that, uh, you meet with me, again, like the, the paper presentation, and you hear my feedback on the project, setting time, et cetera, like before. Please make sure, both for your Shia deadline and for my deadline, don't set a time, everybody on the last day, it's not going to work. Be, you know, either set the time early or uh, make sure that it's spread across uh, several days so we can handle that. August 3rd, which is, I think, a Tuesday, you submit the final project report, and August uh, and August fifth, uh, yeah, and August fifth is is uh, uh, please uh, uh, free the the day, and we'll have uh, an event. We'll have project presentations at at the campus, uh, afternoon evening. Uh, hopefully, if everything is fine by then, by then uh, we're going to get some pizza and beers or something like that. You can bring good avak and. Uh, Finally, we'll meet uh, face to face. I, I'm really looking forward for that and to see your projects. And then I have a quickly, quickly, I need to, to decide to, to determine the grades. And, and, and uh, but again, it's a process and I'm going to evaluate each stage of this process. Project report, it's very important. Uh, don't, uh, it's very important that you do it uh, appropriately. I need to understand what's going on, right? If I'll not be able to understand what you did and what, you, what, what were your goals, I'm not going to be able to evaluate your uh, project uh, properly and you're going to, to suffer for that in, in your grade. So English, uh, try to be concise. I mean, I don't care. You can write a lot and I'll read time. I'm reading really fast, but, uh, but it's, not, it's not good practice. Try to write in the minimum space that you need to show, your, uh, to show what, you, what you achieved and what you wanted to do include enough information for me to be able to understand it. Simple words, write things, things, that you, th things, that, things that you need to write to someone who is actually, and this is a big problem in a lot of uh, reports that I read, uh, that they, whoever writes them do not think that the others who are not within their heads need to, to actually read that afterward and understand what they thought. So be simple, but precise on what, what you try to do. Uh, sufficient background on the project and your goals. Uh, results and their interpretation, and then discuss what you would, uh, you know, discuss the interpretation of the results, what are the implications, what did you discover, what you, you would do next if this is a project that you will take further. Uh, again, it's a proof of principle. I know it's like a paper I'm telling it, but it's, I want to see you, I want to see you think in this uh, project, not just uh, take a network and apply to something and get the result. Available data sets. So if you were looking at cell painting, which we learned uh, in this course already, here are uh, four different uh, cell painting uh, data sets. Uh, the first is also, I'm going to tell you a little, uh, is a little more organized by Naor from the lab. I'll, I'll show you a bit later. Um, yeah, the, the, risk, the most recent one is uh, COVID related. So it might uh, intrigue some of you. And, 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 and in the screening data, for some of them, for example, in the in the first one, in the second one, uh, they have uh, uh, feature vectors for each cell. So each cell is is uh, annotated with uh, not annotated. It, it, it has its own uh, extracted uh, vectors that represents it with features uh, that that already uh, was uh, ex extracted by whoever generated this data set. Yeah, you can also have access to the to the images themselves. The data sets are really, really large. Of course, I'm not expecting you just take a part of, just take part of it, a few plates from the screen and just use it because you're not expected to, you're not expected to handle this amount of uh, big data. It's not, it's going to take you more time than my course. And the last, uh, the last one is a, is a COVID related screen, which you might find interesting. So they had uh, healthy cells and sick cells and they looked at trajectories between them, how, how uh, treatments uh, shift the appearance of uh, the cells, the, the phenotype of the cells from uh, COVID infected cells to mock cells, to cells that are, were not infected. And there they have also, they have uh, 
they have latent space encoding and they have the image themselves. They don't have direct extracted features like size and etc. And this is actually also a data set that was generated by this company, uh, Recursion, that I told you that just had uh, just went public uh, a month or two months ago. More uh, open resources. Uh, so there is the image that data resource. I'm going to talk about it uh, maybe next week. Let's see how it goes. And there are other data sets that you can uh, look at, uh, which I'm also going to talk about in the sport. Dell Institute of Cell Science, we talked about it a little bit when we talked about the uh, organization of cells and the deep learning uh, parts. Human Protein Atlas is uh, basically images where you have, uh, uh, you have some landmark markers and you have a protein and you need the, the task is to, and there was a big cag, uh, Kaggle challenge on that uh, to predict which protein or where it is localized within the cell. There are other data sets of screening. Brenda Andrews have some uh, yeast uh, data set that can be useful. And here is more, the Bray et al. I said already, I think I had it in a previous slide. And you can see, for example, this, uh, this uh, last uh, bullet, uh, 2008, you can have a data set of uh, cells uh, leukocytes uh, tracking in, uh, in uh, so these are trajectories. So the data is trajectories of cells, so temporal information. Um, I think even in 3D that you can take and explore. And now I want to talk about the three data sets that uh, are uh, that the people from our lab are working with, and you have the privilege to to take and uh, do your projects on them if you'd like. And I'm going to quickly present um, the, the data and what each of the uh, Naor guy and Ishaya are doing in terms of the their projects. And uh, yeah, and I'm going to leave it open. I think there are a lot of things that can be done on each of them. Questions so far? I can't see you now because are you still with me? Yeah, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so this is just a proof of concept or do we need to implement uh, something? Well, proof of concept is usually require some implementation. I mean, you need to do something, right? It's an hand on, it's an, a hand on project, right? You will code. Okay, this is your question? Yeah. It's not just an idea coming up with an idea. You need to to code and try something. Okay. Okay. Other question? It's a it's a big task. This is this is basically it's eighty percent of the course. I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, could you upload an example for the the paper that we need to the to upload at the end? Uh, when, what, 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 what I, no, because I don't have it. I didn't read it, write it yet. So. An example of, of last year's uh, uh, work that they did, something that we can reference when we're writing the, the project itself. I actually prefer not to do it because I think that uh, last year I didn't give good enough instructions and the project were, uh, I didn't give public the idea. I didn't give a data set for my own. It came much earlier in the course, and people did some uh, less creative or more uh, less less thoughtful uh, projects, and uh, and I didn't give uh, clear instructions on what to do. So it was my my bad. I didn't do. I didn't handle it well. Um, I mean, uh, so 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 I think it will not be very helpful um, even the good projects where yeah, I'm not sure how they'll be helpful. I mean, just, you know, just try to be, to be, to, to you know, to, 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 to briefly explain what is the problem, the data and the results. I mean, it's not, uh, and if you have any, if you have any questions and you know, we have this, just, just ask, you know, just, Come with a specific question, and I'll try to answer. I don't think that there were any. The reports were not very good, and projects 
also they were not exactly what I was uh, hoping from this course last last year, and I tried to improve a lot of things this year, so it will be more, so it will be better, and so you'll you'll understand better what I'm looking for. Okay, thank you. Please do ask if you have something that is not clear. Don't hesitate. Okay. Okay, let's go back. If there are no other questions. So the first uh, project is uh, is Naos, basically Naos project. And it took some uh, high content phenotyping, some cell painting data. And he's looking at a very interesting uh, question or idea. So data, uh, the data is uh, from Bray et al. This is a cell painting. So cell painting, as we say, there are the five channel. For example, here on the five channels, you can see healthy cells and at the bottom you can see uh, sick cells, affected cells, they are after, not sick, but after some, actually this is a different cell type, A549, but anyway, it's a perturbed, it's a perturbation and you can see something different, it doesn't matter exactly uh, what it is. And, uh, and, and, uh, and again, I'm, I'm reminding you when we look about, uh, when we look at cells, the idea is that uh, we're looking at the organization of a cell to define the cell state. And if something is detected within the organization of the cell, which we can see within the images, then it means that the cell will not, will not function as we would expect. Then something is wrong in the behavior or different at least in the behavior of the cell, in what, what it can do in its function. Okay, so this is basically the idea. <clears throat> so the cell painting is trying to give us some, some ability to do that, by having multiple channels, so multiple organelles within the cell and giving us all this information. So each image, we get five different channels of information that encode a lot of the organization within the cell. Now, the hypothesis, the working hypothesis of uh, NO is uh, as follows. Uh, here, yes, uh, you have here five different channels. So these are the floors and channels that you see here in circle. And this is like the well, right? The organization within the well and blue, it means that it's a control, that everything is fine here. And if we perturb, if we perturb, a, uh, provide the perturbation and it perturbs an organelle, then we're going to see something like that. So the yellowish colors are the perturbation and the, and the, 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 the change, the perturbation, cause you can see here the, a difference in this organelle. And basically, this is what we do now. In screening, what we do in, the, in, the, in everything that I showed you in the screening domain is taking control, comparing it to the representation. So each of these, you can extract a lot of features from each of these channels. And now you can look at these features and you can see where they change according to the perturbation. And then you can say, okay, this, this is a orange perturbation caused the, the cells to be, the, the organelles to become more spiky within the cell. Okay, can you follow so far? Yes, no? Yes. No, I don't have two screens now, so it's a problem. I cannot see you. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's clear. <laughs> okay, so this is a perturbation, which this is standard, there is nothing new here. But what Noel says is something uh, much cooler. He says, okay, here is the purple uh, perturbation. Let's see what happens here. And what we can see here that what changes is the organization of the different organelles. So the organelle doesn't necessarily even change, but the organization within the, within the well, within the cell is changing. So I was always giving an example, probably not the best. I think this is a better example, but I'm, I'll still give my stupid example of uh, if you break your arm, uh, maybe you can see it, right? You can image it and you can see that the, the arm is not exactly as a healthy arm and something is wrong. But if you break the arm and throw it to the other side of the room, then the relation between the arm and your other organ, your organ is going to be very, very, it's going to alter a lot, it's going to change a lot and it will be easy to identify. And it's a real effect. It's a real perturbation that no one measures today. So in this case, if we only measure the circle, right? The features that come from the, bluish, uh, the, the cyan and blue and red and orange and purple, and we compare it to what we have in the control, we will not see any change. Only if we see the changes in the spatial organization and the relation between different organelles, then we'll be able to say that, the, that the something is uh, 
has changed within our cell and it's a real change that now we are not, we're just not measuring. So we now we had this hypothesis that uh, if we'll do it this way, then we'll have a measure that first is a new measure for measuring in screening. And second, that it will be more sensitive because when something, you change something, when you, when you perturb something within your cell, it's not only going to change the, the organelles that you perturb, it's going to change everything around it, the, how it interacts with within the cell. So this, this is an hypothesis, it's just, just an idea. And in order to test it, uh, now uh, I'll tell you immediately what it is. First, the data, so we have 400 uh, plates. Uh, what you see here is like, it took like small, these are like uh, cells, right? I think it's something, Ah, well, we don't have it here. Anyway, it's like, a, it's a weird thing. It's hard to see it when it's small, but it's like mini miniature cells. Anyway, each one of them is a well. He has a three, three, uh, 30K treatment. It's not the data set that he gives you, but you know, it's too large, but... And then in each plate, you have control wells and you have treated wells. Well is a berit. In each berit, you have an image with many cells within it, okay? And basically this gives you an, an ability to build, you know, you have a lot of controls and then each of these perturbed um, wells are different perturbations. So now you can build models out of the controls and see how they break in the perturbations. Like here, you have a lot of controls, you build models and then you see how they break, how they di differentiate. So here is what uh, Nao did. He takes his uh, wells of cells. Here you have the five channels. So these are each color here represent a channel. And now you extract features from this channel. And basically the features that he uses and you're going to have access to is the features that represent the, that represent the, um, the basically they were uh, engineered features. So they're ex extracted from the images, uh, shape, texture, etc. stuff like that. And now, you can take the control. And since we want to, to model the interplay, the, the relations between the different organelles, so what Noor decided to do is to look at four organelles in each image or each cell take, actually it's a, a single cell measurement. So for each cell take the features taken from four, four organelles and building a predictive model to predict the fifth organelle features. So it's a mapping between four groups of features to a fifth group of features in the control. And then you have five models like that. That basically uh, build you the, the mapping between uh, the mapping between uh, four channels and the fifth channel based on the control. And now when you go to treatment, you, you, you take a treatment well and you use the model from the control on the treatment. And then you see whether you were able to, whether you, you uh, model from the control was ever, was able to predict what happened in the perturbation. And if the prediction was wrong, so if the error here was much larger than, than the errors that you would get in a similar model, in this case, it's, uh, which one is it? Uh, this one, the top one. So you measure how wrong it is compared to what you would expect are the errors of, in the control cell then you would say that something broke in the mapping between a uh, four organelles and the fifth one. Yeah, so this is the perturbation. And then in order to show that uh, the measurement that he extracted on the organization uh, are, are sensitive and they actually capture something real and something that is really informative more than what we have uh, the, today, he looked at the errors within the reconstruction errors within the control. He looked at its statistics and said on how much we were deviated from that uh, based on the perturbation. And then he, he looked, he compared, the, he compared the error in the, in the features themselves to the errors in the reconstruction. And this is what he got. So what you see here, it's, it's very preliminary and you see that it's not very nicely but what you see here, uh, the, the time here in the GIF is, uh, is a different threshold for defining what is a hit. The x-axis is the standard approach of looking at the features. 
and defining a deviation from the control. And the y-axis is looking at the mapping between features and looking at deviation from the control. And basically when you see that we have more points above the line, it means that the, the measure is more sensitive. So the, looking at the features themselves give you some deviation from the control. And since we are above, it, it gives us more deviation from the control, which means that our measure is more sensitive. Each uh, dot here is a well, and a color is from what plate it came. So it's, uh, it's uh, independent of uh, anything. So this is a NAO project. It also shows that the, that it can replicate results. So if you found the heat in one plate, the same patterns appear in other plates. And it's pretty cool because you get for each, uh, uh, for each uh, well, you get five, in this case, yeah, five. The red is, one of them is old, the, the purple is old. But you get five different features, mapping of features. And you can see that in this case, one feature is, uh, is, is, uh, is, uh, um, is, re is reconstructed differently than the other features. And you can see, I'm not going to go into the details, but in principle, you can see that when you go to specific hits within the screen, you can see that the measure is more sensitive and it is also independent. So you can, you can have, for example, the same property, the same ability to discriminate based on the, uh, at the feature level and, and very different uh, uh, magnitude in the mapping level. So that's it. I, do you, are you still following me or did I lose you completely? Yes, we are following. What? I am following. That's okay. Some are here. Yep. So no questions. Cool. So you are really fast. Uh, it's the first time that I'm talking about this project. So, uh, so I didn't feel that I explained it perfectly, but if you are still following and don't have any questions, then that's a good sign for me. Uh, so the data, uh, here, is, here is the representation of the data. And in the links that I shared with you before, in one of the previous slides, there is the, so you have access to the data, including a readme file that has explanations that should make your life easier to understand how the data is organized. So in principle, these type of data are going to be, they're already pre-processed for you to use and it would be easier for you to, to play with. But sometimes it's, yeah. So this is just one idea. This is just the now idea then you can do, there is a lot that can be done with this data. I mean, you can, yeah. So here's an explanation. I'm not going to go over that. You can go over that yourself. So we should uh, take the data and uh, think about other stuff we can do with it? Yeah. Okay. So in principle, you have uh, uh, for each uh, cell base. So, so, so think about hierarchy. You have the hierarchy of the plate. And uh, a plate is the experiment, right? Full experiment. You have control from that pl plate uh, and diff different wells. Each well varies. It's a different uh, kind of experiment. So each of these are independent. Usually you use the control to build the model or something that represent or, or look at features that present what happened to the control cells within your system. And then you see how they deviate. Or you can come up with pulling together control wells from different plates and building a general model and then going to a different place and seeing how much it, you know, it, it, it deviates from that. And you can, you can come up with new ideas on how to define what is the heat in the screen or how to use heterogeneity or, uh, or how to, I don't know. I'm letting you think about the, about the creative ideas of what can be done or use the new methods for, uh, you know, use a fancy new neural network for, uh, for uh, mapping or prediction or whatever. More questions about the screening data. Okay. Second, ERC signaling. Okay, so ERC signaling is a project that the uh, guy is Eidman. He's actually an undergraduate in the in the department. He's the uh, uh, and, and the data is from uh, the lab of Jared Totcher in. Uh, in Princeton. Uh, actually, I'm going next week, I'm going also to mention this paper, but probably today I'm going 
to mention more of the paper and go a little bit deeper on what they did in, the, in their paper. I was hoping to get through it today, but it's not going to happen. Uh, so what is ERK? ERK is some molecule within the cell. I mean, it's very important for a lot of biological processes, but I'm not going to bother you with that. The cool thing about this data is that it is a screen of live imaging. So you have temporal information here. So each cell has its own time series of ERK signaling, but who cares, right? I mean, and then you have control cells and you have, you have, you have wells of control and you have wells that are perturbed. And you can ask, start asking questions about that. So I'm going to briefly show you what uh, uh, Jared did in, in, in their paper. And then I'm going to briefly show you what Guy is doing and then you can do whatever you want. So here is what uh, they did. They take a mouse, they isolate uh, cells that are called uh, uh, keratinocytes. Uh, they, uh, they, they, they do whatever, they, whatever tricks they do to, 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 uh, to activate, uh, uh, to activate uh, the ERK signaling, the image. And now for each cell you have ERK signature and ERK signature. Data. 400, uh, but it's on time, right? It's in time. We didn't have time before. Data, we have a library of uh, perturbations, which are the treatments. Each perturbation is in a separate well. Well, this is standard now for us. Uh, they image each well for five hours every three minutes. And uh, they take the raw data and then may make for each cell a time series. So they take the compound, the treatment, they put on the well, on a well, the image, then they have time series. And what they do here actually is they extract from the time series, they explicitly extract different properties that relate to the time series, such as uh, the time that the, the peak, uh, how much between, how much time goes between peaks, what is the frequency, and what is the magnitude of the activity. So they're like really for each cell, they, they measure like four or five properties in their paper which is already something that you can think of improving, right? I mean, why, why use only a few properties? You can, you can do much more than that. And so what they do, and then what they do, they, uh, they, 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 they do the drug perturbations, and then they characterize different clusters of behavior of perturbations by the drug. So the data eventually, you have the spatial location of each cell, each cell the XY location of each, each cell, and for each cell, you have a time series. And what they did, and this is their main result in terms of the screening, I'll tell you next week what they did beyond screening. Uh, they, they extracted like very few features, like I, I, said, I, I, I said here, like maybe four features or five. They did principal component analysis. And here are your control cells. Here are your uh, cluster, and then they did some clustering. And then they looked at the characteristics of each cluster and they characterized it in terms of what are the characteristic ERK dyna dynamics. And then they, they did follow up, which I'm going to tell you about tomorrow. Is it clear what they did? And low, Ulai? Hello. Then ask a specific question, Igor. Uh, how would they. Um... How they uh, come count four classes? How they uh, uh, took uh, the data to different classes? Or what, what do we see here? You say why did they select uh, n equal uh, k equal four for the clusters? Or, or yes. What, what, what are those yeah. clusters? Yeah. Well, I don't remember exactly what clustering they did here, frankly. Uh, probably they didn't do something very fancy, right? They probably did uh, like something like this, right? And decided on four clusters. Um, yeah, but they did basically, and, and you can see here, even with the principal component, there is no clear clusters of the hits. First, the hits means that they are further away in their dynamics from what you get in your controls, in your purple, not purple, and I'm really bad with colors in English, with your gray controls. And, and then the clustering, well, I don't think they did the best job in the world, but I, I don't remember what they did. Maybe, maybe. It, seems, it seems that the different clusters represent the one, two, and three different drugs. 
hacked. Ah, you think that? I'm not, not sure. I think that they found relation. Maybe maybe you are right. I'm not sure. So Alina proposes that the clusters are because you see your clusters because you see your names of drugs. Maybe you are right. I'm not sure. As in the, then then it means that uh, different drugs, uh, the drugs that are from the same family, have a similar effect on the cells. I'm not sure that you are right, but maybe you are. I think that they did here some clustering based on the data, and uh, and then also showed that there is some relation, and showed the, the the treatment. But maybe I'm wrong. I don't remember. Okay. 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 Anyway, now they have class classes clusters, and uh, okay. Now I'm going to tell you about the data, and get, then I'm going to tell you about directions that the guy is taking. But I think also, so I, I already think here you can do a lot of uh, things here, looking at the time series differently, uh, and then trying to play with that and seeing what you get. So trying to see limitations in their approach could be a cool project, and 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 yeah. So before I go to Guy, which I think is can give you a lot of idea also on cool things that can be done quite uh, quite straightforward. Uh, here is the data. So he has uh, nine plates. Each uh, plate has 50 wells, and in each well you have the coordinates of the each cell, x y coordinates, and the temporal intensities of the ERC signaling. So you have a time series, and uh, yeah. And you ah, and each map also has, of course, the treatment. I mean, al always in screen, you need to know exactly for each well, you need to know what was treated, how the well was treated. So what the guy was looking for is taking here. So they completely ignored the spatial information. ERC, I mean, this is from other papers. It's known that ERC is also related to cell-to-cell -cell communication. So cell cells uh, that interact with one another, you can see some relation with the ERC signaling. You can actually see some really cool movies of ERC waves. So when you look at the ERC, you can see waves are going through, uh, for example, developing embryos of, uh, I don't remember what, some animal fish or fly or whatever. And, but there is also other ERC is very important for a lot of biological processes. And, 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 and it relates to cell-to-cell -cell communication. So what Guy is trying to do is look at the correlation between uh, ERC signaling in space. So basically what you, saw, what you can see here is he looked at the distribution of correlation. So he looked at all the pairs of cells within, again, you look here, oops. Yeah, for example here, so, and now you pick pairs of cells and you look at all the pairs. So if you have N cells, it's N to the square, right? Square of N. And you look at the correlation between uh, these two time series. And this will give you basically the, the, the amount of synchronization, a measure for the synchronization in the ERC activities between the cells. And if you look at the distribution along all the pairs, uh, this is what you get across different uh, uh, treatments, uh, across your controls, DMSO is control. And when he looked at hits, he found that most of the hits in, in this, in communication, we call it hits in communication, made uh, were, were uh, characterized by shifts actually to the right side. So more synchronization between the cells. So the cells are more coordinated in their ERC signaling following a perturbation. So perturbation is not always loss of function, not always doing something wrong. Sometimes it actually improves the function of the cells. And if you look at it systematically, you can see some interesting things. And I summarized it here, uh, the main, uh, um, um, messages that I think he has so far in his uh, preliminary analysis. So he looked at the classes that were defined, and, and this is also a sub a sub a subset of the data. And you can see controls in the, in the, in the, in, the, in black here, I'm bad with colors, you know now. And uh, and then you can see with color code the classes that were defined based on, on, on the single cell dynamics. So here there is nothing about communication and, uh, and Guy wanted to see first, what are phenotypes in communication? And second, whether we can find relations between phenotypes in, 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 um, in, in, in the signaling themselves to the, to the phenotype in communication. So mapping how a single cell behaves, what it does in time in terms of air signaling, 
and um, measurement on the population level on the correlation within on the synchronization or correlation between pairs of cells within the population. So what he found, first hits in this case are the guys here in the, so, okay, so first the measurement, and he used here two measurements that me measure something that is very similar. You would expect them to be very correlated as you, as you can see here. One is the mean correlation, which is basically the mean of this distribution, right? Mean pair correlation. So this is the X axis between pairs of cells. And the second is measured for heterogeneity. So this uh, distance from the uniform distribution. So basically this is more homogeneous. This is more distance from the uniform distribution than this, right? So if you have a larger standard deviation, it means that you are more further away from the uniform distribution. And basically you would expect that since you see it shifts to the right, you would expect that when you have a more homogeneity, the cells are more, uh, are, are, the, 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 the pairs of cells are more, uh, uh, there is less variability in their correlations. You would expect also the correlations to grow. And this is what you see here in the nice uh, correlation between those two measurements. But you also, what you also see is a few uh, interesting uh, observations. So I want to pick a color that is not uh, used here. Which one? Uh, uh, so the I would put off the product of the machine. So first, Can I ask a question? yes, uh, the correlation in the spatial uh, axis. What what do what what is considered uh, correlated when they move on the same time on this to the same direction, same distance, for example? So it's not motion. I mean, basically, what you have here for each cell, you have a time series, right? It's not motion. This is the uh, the signaling. So yeah, this but is you the... said that uh, each... Leon, I can't hear you. Can each, you each cell is is uh, recorded uh, uh, the 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 is position across. Yeah, but the, the position doesn't change much. So yeah, I mean, one of the questions that you can ask is whether there is, and, and, and I think that the guy looked at it a little bit, and I think that they also looked at it and couldn't find any relation between the, the, the motility of the cells and the earth signaling or the communication properties. So in principle, it doesn't really matter. Also, guy, guy found that the, when you look spatially, there is no, so this is, there is no uh, bias towards, so you, you are not more coordinated with your close neighbors as a cell in this case, okay? So the correlation to nearest neighbors and to cells that are further apart is similar, which means that the system is already kind of synchronized. There is no, it's not that you, you are more familiar with your close friends and less familiar with distant cells. Sadar Leon? I can't hear Leon. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so in principle, if we are looking for Achebachatiseva, if we are book, if we are looking for heat, basically you look at the control. You can look, you can project to the x-axis, for example. Just look at the x-axis. If you look at the control and even take, you know, a little a safe uh, space uh, beyond controls, you see that you get some hits here. And these here hits are actually hits that are improving synchronization within the system. They are increasing the correlation and increasing the distance from uniform. So. The cells are more homogeneous, so pairs of cells are more similar to one another in how they communicate, and uh, the, the mean correlation uh, grows. So these are hits within the screen, and it's interesting to see that there is not necessarily, so all the hits are not the, the green ones, are actually the, so, so you find some relations between the behavior of single cells in the ERK activity to communication properties of single cells, pairs of cells, but not in the in the not in class three, but only in class one and two. When you find and and it's not the uh, it's not it, it doesn't come hand by hand. So you can have a, a hit in, for example, in the single cell behavior, all the green here and everything here. You can have a very strong hit within your uh, green uh, uh, within your single cell behavior, which is not mapped necessarily for the collective behavior. And for example, here you can look at the green. Look at this. You have greens that are really, really further apart from the purple in terms of a single cell uh, ERK dynamics. 
but when you go to the collective setting for the communication, you don't find any, any heat in communication, which means that they are decoupled. So there is a lot of interesting things here. Another interesting thing here is that the model changes. So you can see the control, everything is, the controls are above. So there is a positive relation, but in principle, the control are above, which means that the relation between the mean correlation and the distance from the uniform also changes in, in these cells. Okay, I think I talked about enough about it. If you have any, I think that's it. The results summary are just what I told you by Balpe, by heart, so you can, uh, orally, so you can uh, just uh, read and see my interpretation. These are very preliminary results. I think this data is very rich. Uh, you can play with it a lot and find cool stuff. For example, you can look at network representation. You can start building a network of, uh, of uh, based on these correlations and try to see, try to look at it from this perspective. Last is a project about, uh, any questions? Okay, last is a, is a project that uh, Yeshaya is leading. It's actually a very, it's a fresh, fresh project uh, that is coming to the lab. Yeshaya actually didn't do here anything beyond uh, organizing the data, but he's going to, work on this data later. He is working on other aspects of cell death. Uh, but this is uh, one specific aspect for, from uh, Kulab in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Sastour Institute in Paris. Uh, and Alexis is the PhD student working, the experimentalist, and Romain is the, is the principal investigator there. And they basically, it's all their slides. We didn't do anything here yet. But, uh, I, I, but we talked with them a couple of weeks ago and then I thought it would be interesting for, for, for a project. So what you see here is uh, actually, actually looking within a drosophila, so within an animal. I'm not sure if they took the, the I think they look within a living drosophila and they image, uh, they image a process of uh, the development of the embryo of a drosophila. And part of the process of developing involve a cell death. So some cells are dying and then they are extruded out of the tissue. Extruded, and I don't know the Hebrew uh, translation, but it's like popped out of the, of the tissue. Uh, I'll say a quick explanation in Hebrew and then, you know what, maybe not. And what you see here in the red R, you can see, oh, the cell is disappearing. So you see a cell, it's a, and then when it starts, ah, let's see from the start, you can see a cell and then it becomes become, oh, tiny and that's it. And then, and then it, it comes up. So the cells around it squeeze it and it comes out. It, it dies and it comes out of the, of the tissue. And this is the mechanism of the tissue to maintain, uh, to maintain what is called homeostasis, uh, the ability to, to control itself. Think about it, that when homeostasis is, is not uh, working properly, uh, it correlates to cancer, so it relates to cancer. So when we, when the tissue does not control the, the the ability to you know to control the number of cells and the organization, at some point it might cause uh, damage in diseases. So this is the experimental system, which is pretty cool. And again, we have your time information. So so what we want to do here is link it. So, so there is a specific also signaling. Uh, 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 proteins that play a role here. They are, they are called caspase that are linked to the cell death and to uh, extrusion. I'm not going, this is uh, some, uh, some uh, a way to image that, with, which is called FRED. I'm not going to, to explain it. What I do want you to follow, is this is why I showed this slide, is that you have a cell here and you have, uh, and you have uh, uh, here you have high caspase is low value. So you see that it's very different from its surrounding in terms of the, space uh, 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 expression levels. And then you can see that, that the cell is becoming smaller and smaller, and then it's extruded. I know this is the biological process that we're interested in. They already did uh, some, uh, some nice uh, preliminary analysis. So what you see in green here, is so on the, on the left here, you see a, 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 you know, an experiment. The green here is the space activity. 
And in the right here, you can see uh, and, and the, um, the, same, uh, the same video. After some processing, you can see the geometry of the cell, so the segmentation, and you can see color map the space level within the cell. And you can see that the cell is, you can see some cells that are, have high caspase activity, and then they shrink and they disappear, right? And they, this means that they are excluded from the tissue. So some analysis that the Alexis did, he showed the correlation, which is trivial. I mean, when you look at the movie, you can see that between uh, the caspase uh, levels within the cells, which you see here in the uh, orange, to the perimeter of the cell, which when it's dropped, it, it means that it's, uh, when it drops, it means that the cells are extruding. And basically it took here only the data set of the cells that they eventually extruded, extruded. And, and look at the numbers, it's a, a very small end, right? This is not big data at this point. It's going to be, but it's going to take probably a couple of years to collect the data that will make it really big data. And since, uh, since the, the, this marker of the space level is a cumulative marker. So how much integrated activity there, there is within the cell. And they also wanted to look at the derivative. So how much the space activity has changed. And this is what you get when you look at the derivative of the single cell, when you look at its distribution over time, when of cells that did uh, some extrusion. And basically what he did, he looked now at this time point. For each cell, he defined this time point. When you see a drop, when the cells are starting to, to change their their uh, morphology, their perimeter, and the phase activity toward extrusion, and follow this process, and started asking whether you can find features that correlated with this extrusion compared to control cells that didn't uh, didn't undergo extrusion. What you see is that the cells that did uh, did go extrusion. Question so far. Okay, so what, what they did, they took single cells, they pinpointed, and everything here is, they did already. So you have all this data, all this process data, which gives you actually fun data to work with for a more data science project. Uh, although here the limitation is the number of cells, and I'm going to tell you in a few minutes why, how you can a little bit at least uh, uh, overcome this, the small number. But what they did here uh, in their analysis, they took, the the time of extrusion that they defined based on the you know based on the time that the, the based on the perimeter of the cell and then they look to the past they go they went to the past and they looked for correlation between different properties parameters of the cell uh, to the the, the 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 derivative of the caspase level so, so the change of the activity of this molecule that you can see here and they found some correlations whatever i mean it's they found some uh, correlations and that's it so this is basically this is the data set there is one single movie but you have a lot of for each uh, cell and you have uh, not too many cells so only 87 excluding cells and uh, around 100 uh, control cells but you have a time series and in this case i think you can use the time series in order to try to 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 increase your data set so you can ask questions here at what time point can I make predictions on how accurate are my predictions regarding exclusion? And you can start thinking about measurements that are not related only to the, to the morphology of the cell, for example, here, and the caspase level, but also how neighboring cells are, are reacting, because we know that there is a relation between how the neighborhood is, is behaving to the cell itself. So you can look at the special location of a cell and integrate features from what's happening around it in the past, and try to make predictions to when the cell is going, whether it's going to extrude, when it's going to extrude, and, and, and stuff like that. And, uh, and, and they annotated everything, and you have all the, all the pre-processing you have it, and they did manual annotations. I mean, the cell masks were manually annotated, so validated, so they did some semi-automated uh, analysis here. They did a lot of work on one experiment to give really high quality in terms of the annotations, which now give you a cool data set to play with. So that's it.
and I'm open to questions. I know it's a little overwhelming. It's also three projects, they're complex. I expect you to go to go home where everybody are home anyway, but uh, to, you know, after class, when you think about potential project, think what, whatever sounded cool to you and whatever you think you might want to do, and then go again and, and, and go over the presentation. And for the, for the last presentation, I have nothing written to give you because it's, you know, nothing was published about it basically. And uh, you can go and talk with Yeshaya who is, uh, who is now taking over this project from my lab. Uh, in the second project, uh, the screening, you can read the paper. The paper is out there, so you can exactly understand everything there and, and uh, start from that point. And the first project is basically screening data, which you are now a world expert after the two or three classes, two, two lessons, I think, maybe even three. Now, let's say two lessons that we talked about the subject. Uh, so you can think what to do with that. And the other data sets, if you want to, to look at them and play with them, go ahead. And I am going to give a class about, uh, about different atlases. They are called cell atlases and stuff like that, that you can use, but uh, it's only going to be, I'm skeptical, I'm not sure, probably not next week, so only the week after that. So this is going to take a little longer. And there are cool things to do there as well. And uh, one caveat there and something that is going to take more, to, to take more of your time is that you'll need to, go to the data that was is public, but not many people are playing with it. The, the, the field is very, there are very few people, data scientists who are actually playing with data, which is, a, which is a pity, but an opportunity for us because we can do whatever we want. Uh, and there another difficulty is just taking the data and, and starting to play with it from the public data because it's public, but it's not like a public data set that hundreds of people are working with and it's kind of standardized. Some of them are like data that only a few people have looked at beyond the people who generated that. So, and I'm, and, and I'm going to consider that in the project. If you're going to take a data set that no one has played with before, I, I, I'm fully aware that the first stage is actually being able to understand what's going on there. And it, it, is, a it is a difficult task, it takes time as well. So questions about the project? Uh, do we get the code to reproduce the project's uh, results? Uh, so for for now, no. For now, you're going to get it. No, you're going to get the data, but it is processed data after after pre-processing. Okay. And 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 for example, looking at correlation in space between cells, right? It's you know, it's two loops. Right, basically, and and then you can. I mean, it's, I'm just saying about the uh, uh, about the uh, guys, guys, guys data, for example. You know, it's simple. And and if you want later, I mean, you have an explanation what the data is. You have a time series. You want to take part of it and predict the future based on it, and take cells around it. Uh, it's uh, it's not very difficult, right? It's not something that is uh, you need. I'm not sure that it will be easier if uh, you'll get code that does that. I'll just say okay. one thing, if, if you're not aware, I mean, if you are looking at the two, the two last projects, I think could be interesting in terms of also, well, maybe one of them, maybe it's just the last one, uh, regarding a partial organ, so space is important, the locations of the cell, uh, and for finding the cells that are neighbors, I'm just going to, to throw a word so you can look at it if, you, if you're going to do that, but it's also easy in Python, you can do it in, like a few lines of code, it's available. Uh, if you want to look at neighbors of uh, based on, uh, you have dots in space in 2D and you want to look which are which which dots are neighbors, so which cells are neighbors to one another, uh, you have something that is called the Voronoi diagram. Uh, it's uh, from computational geometry. And basically it gives you a, a, a partitioning of the space where uh, you can use it anyway, very easily. And if you need help with that, then Yeshaya can help you, for example, to find the neighbor. Okay. okay, thank you. More questions? Okay, so thank you all you brave uh, fighters of uh, whatever. Survivors. Survivors of, uh, yeah, of the- Hamas. It has a name, Homot something, no? Yeah? 
חומות סמפינג מבצע? שומר חומות. שומר חומות, נכון. And uh, I think it's enough for today, right? I mean, uh, for me it's enough, I think. But I think we'll stop here. One thing good about academia is that we can do whatever we want. So, uh, so let's stop here and uh, spend uh, you know, the rest of the time that I was supposed to speak to you about, uh, th about thinking about the project uh, and start thinking about it, okay? I mean, don't wait to the last minute. Lidrot. See you next week. Happy, Bye, happy, 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 happy,